So um, without much more of ado, I'm going to hand over to this double act and they'll uh, take us forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Kerry Bailey. I'm a medical doctor. And this is Dr. Kelly Nock, who's got a PhD in cosmology, and she's one of our data scientists. Um, James Davis, who is our founder, wanted to be here today. He's, he is on his way, but he's been in, on business in the States, so he may appear at any moment. James started his company, Predictive Analytics Service, based in the automotive sector, and we have contracts with GM, JLR, Ford, Honda, etc. Now, all of these companies have big analytics teams, but we bring something as a service, robust statistics, automation of all our services, and insights which these companies wouldn't otherwise have. Here's a screenshot of what our service looks like um, in automotive. And just to point out a few things, you can look at either temperature or rainfall, you can bring in climate. So we bring in disparate data sets um, to our analysis, and you can zoom down by the area. And you can look even at cities or individual um, suppliers. I'm not going to talk too much about automotive because I don't know much about cars. Um, this is a Gartner chart. Gartner, I hope you know, who do analysis of, of IT, etc. And predictive analytics isn't easy. You can do computer learning, and that's com completely appropriate to some situations. But as we learned from Google Flu, you can make inappropriate assumptions, and your models can be wrong if you just depend on computer learning. Prescriptive analytics then also, which we're just moving into, deciding which interventions may be appropriate, modeling some different ones, and making suggestions what might work. But it gets more difficult, but it's more valuable to the company or the organization. So James brought together um, a certain model of service. Now, underlying everything at Digital 15, obviously, is computer science. And the majority of people at work at We Predict are computer scientists. And CompSci get involved with the data cleansing as well as the data quality. And they work with our statisticians um, and our data scientists to really clean that data, make it relevant. But they also do the visualizations. And we've got PhD and MSc uh, people who can make that data come alive to any audience. The other thing that makes this difference is having our domain specialists, so making it relevant. So if certain models are developed, we could say, no, that, that isn't really related. That's such a spurious correlation. And we can also talk to our clients to understand exactly it is what they need. So such to myself as a doctor, but we have engineers, et cetera, on the automotive side. And so I just say this is our whole team behind here. We're based in Swansea. We've got five salesmen in the US who happen to be over. So we're a small company in Wales. So James and I sat down a couple of years ago and said, the techniques you're using in automotive, would they be useful in healthcare? And we started to think, at the time, there was one of those unscheduled care crises that pop up every winter and then seem to disappear again at this time of year. It costs our country a lot, unscheduled care, much more than a routine admission. Now, some of these are avoidable. There's different estimates, 10%, 90%. It depends on the condition. It depends um, on lots of different things. But some of it is definitely avoidable. By using predictive analytics, you can start to understand more about which patients are presenting, when, and for what, and which interventions you can put in place. Now, there's quite a lot of work going around in this sector, which is at the patient level. Most of us will have had a risk prediction score, or how likely we are to have an emergency admission over the next year, which not many people know. But there isn't much going on in, in this area. And at the time, I was working in a PCT, Primary Care Trust in England, and we're just about to become a CCG. Um, a clinical commissioning group, you know, the last reorganization in England. And they brought in several people from industry. One day over the photocopier, one of these new industry chaps who was going to completely change and scheduled care, happened to mention that 
He didn't even know what his true activity was over the last year, let alone could he buy, commission the care for the next year. And he also was being asked to put a million pounds into an intervention which was meant to reduce his unscheduled care, but he didn't know by how much. Nobody had modelled for him that he could save some money or he was going to get less admissions in the elderly or something. And so it became absolutely clear that this is something that is being done in industry and we're not doing it in the public sector to the same degree. And we do need to be doing this. If, you know, it's, this is a time of austerity. We all need to spend less, but we've got to be clever at how we do that within the public sector, and predictive analytics can help that. So as a GP, um, a typical sort of story will be a lady will come in, say she's 57, and has hardly used health services, maybe for contraception or to have her children. She's maybe had admissions. She comes in and she's got high blood pressure. So we start on medication and we monitor her and I may advise her to lose weight and take more activity, but perhaps she doesn't. And over the next 10 years then she develops diabetes and perhaps she's still not adhering to his recommendations to go to the dietitian or increase her activity. And it's not inevitable then, but it happens far too often first signs of blindness, kidneys start to fail. And in a few years, unfortunately, she may die from the consequence of diabetes and high blood pressure. Now, you can see that as an individual and you can see these patients when they come into the surgery, but what we need to be able to do as a society is bring all of those stories together and understand where we could have intervened, what services we need to intervene at. When the data comes into us, it comes in a separate data stream. So all the GP data will be one data stream. And this just comes in as numbers, but it tells that story of Mrs. Jones from cradle to grave or whenever she's seen a GP or been into hospital. So the inpatient data, outpatient, all with different codes. And then demographic data when people are born or when they die. And we have to bring this all together and make sense of it. And having done that, we can start to then separate out the different groups. Now imagine that we've got two women, identical in every way, and when you've got large data sets, you can start to identify these groups, who are maybe the same age, same wealth, same area, but they have different BMIs. And we can follow them through time and see what the consequences. Well, you don't know it's definitely the BMI, but when you've got lots of data, you can start to understand what the differences mean to those individuals and the diseases that they develop be they cancers, be they diabetes, and then the earlier death, the early mortality that happens. Um, and Kelly has done this in, in parts of Wales as well, and you can start to see those 10 years difference in life expectancy come out of the data. And then you can start to make predictions about, well, if people did lose 10% of their weight, we can model forward what a difference that would be. And she'll talk more about this in a moment. And healthy environments, we can, we've also got data for where fast food outlets are, and you can start to see where the differences in density of fast food outlets impacts on obesity or diabetes. And this isn't routinely done currently. The current data for obesity in Wales sits at health, what's published sits at health board level. So we know what the percentage is over a whole health board, say 66% overweight, but it's not done with that amount of detail yet. The data sits there. We know exactly what each area, what the obesity rates are, um, and we can draw it out of this data. Now, all of this at the moment is R&D. What we want to see, of course, is this be routinely available and routinely used for planning our services and planning care for patients. Do you want to talk about our processes? Yeah, sure. So, as Kerry just mentioned, some of this work that we've been doing is um, in R&D at the moment. And we were lucky enough to win some funding from the Small uh, Business Research Initiative to work with one of our local health boards using data from the Sale Data Bank, which sits at Swansea University. And this is a really great, vast data set that covers uh, you know, the GP data, the inpatient, outpatient demographic. And uh, they have done some really good quality linking of that data for us. So this squashing of all those timelines down to a single timeline um, that is more accessible in terms of telling a story about a, a patient. Um, but that's really the first step for us. And we got this data, or got access to this data, and that was really the start of what we wanted to look at in order to answer the questions that the health board had. So for us, the next step is to redefine the data in a way that is more accessible for the way we want to use it. So rather than taking these multiple 
um, points in the data set where a patient has gone in uh, and had some GP uh, time, where there's lots and lots of different codes for everything and anything that could be recorded. What we do is take those codes and uh, automate and formalize uh, a definition, for example, of diabetes. So some of the work that we looked at to be able to say a patient is diabetic or not, this binary flag, takes over 300 different codes from uh, the different data sets in order to do so. And we automate that process and check data quality, et cetera, et cetera, so that then we can go forward and say, uh, so what, what, what next? What happens when we know that we've got some people with diabetes? How does that compare to people who don't have diabetes? And, and we can follow it forward from there. So that data redefinition is um, a huge piece of work for us, and we don't take shortcuts in it. Um, when we're looking for patient BMI measures, we might find that we've got some BMI measures that the GP has been kind enough to, to put into the system. Um, but we also find that we might have some heights and weights not necessarily taken at the same time. So then you might have to decide, OK, uh, so will an average 18-year-old male change height much over a five-year period? If we think they will, then maybe we can't use the height and the weight combination uh, because there's too much time passed. So this redefinition process is vast and but very important. And we need to do that before we can even start doing descriptive analysis. So before we can start understanding what's, what's happening now, right here and now, um, how much, what is the prevalence of diabetes, how many unscheduled care admissions are we, uh, are we having in, in any one area, and who are the people making up that population. Um, and we need to understand that history before we can go forward and then make the predictions and try and understand where to target interventions in order to prevent um, or, or reduce the amount of unscheduled care, for example, in the future. So that process is, is what we, we do, and we do it well as a company, and we do it as a team. We have our comp sci who do all the robust um, data structuring and the redefinitions, and they have data scientists like myself who do the statistics and the predictive modeling. But then also we have people like Kerry uh, who provides the context. So we know that the questions that we're getting asked we can interpret efficiently and well, and we can weed out any spurious correlations or anything that doesn't make sense that um, couldn't ever be operationalized in the real world. As we said, this is all R&D for the moment. Our core business is automotive. We're R and we have R&D in health and also now in crime. And these are through the SBRI, the Small Business Research Initiative. The question that first came our way with Wales was how to improve health through the better use of data, which is great for us. Um, Diabetes and obesity. We chose this as one of our priority areas to start with because 10% of the NHS budget is spent on diabetes and 90% of diabetes is type 2 diabetes and 80% of type 2 diabetes is preventable. So if we can work together to decrease obesity, increase physical activity, decrease sugar, etc., then we can prevent a lot of the diabetes. Even those cases of diabetes we can't prevent, we can stop or slow down um, the consequences of diabetes. So Kelly's going to talk through um, just a, a tiny bit of, of what we did. We don't have permission to share, unfortunately, all the detail of our analysis, which is absolutely fascinating. We hope that we will be able to do in the future. Okay, so I've touched on briefly um, the fact that we go through a process to get to, to where we go. Um, but essentially, it follows these, these four sort of key areas. We have the data, we have lots of it, and we've been collecting it for years and years and years, um, often without real purpose. Um, but now we've got this opportunity to use it in a way that's meaningful, that um, we can turn it into intelligence. And there are tons of tools out there that enable us to do this, whether you're, you know, you're, you're purchasing a piece of software to do it yourself, or you're coming to us who will provide a service and do um, every single aspect of the analysis in collaboration with you, um, you can get the intelligence out, uh, and then that is what's necessary to 
implement the change of service, which will then ultimately achieve your goals. And in this circumstance, it was about improving health. So for the, the type 2 diabetes and obesity, uh, the intelligence that we wanted to get out included things like the current status, how many diabetics have we got in the area, what's the distribution uh, of BMI across the region. Um, and we, from this vast data set, we were enabled to um, model what having type 2 diabetes um, looks like. And so we know um, the sorts of people who are going to become type 2 diabetic, and we've followed them through the, the history. And from that, we can start saying, well, what would happen if we put a proportion of that population on a weight loss program or had some sort of weight loss intervention? And from this, we created uh, some simulations where we could say, let's target, like Kerry was talking about before, the, t the two ladies um, that are similar in all other respects apart from their BMI. Let's target the one with a higher BMI and say, everybody who has a BMI of greater than 30 in this population should lose 5% of their body weight over a, a three-month period, which is current NICE guidance, and 20% um, of that population will be successful at doing so. And we can put that into our models, and from that we can see how that would compare in terms of the number of diabetics coming out, um, and an associated cost saving uh, on the NHS, which then can be ploughed back into the initial intervention in the first place with a real business justified uh, case for doing so. Um, and you're targeting the right population. And, and we've built from the data and models to enable us to be able to do this. And when we shared it with the partners that we're working with uh, on this piece of, piece of work, they were amazed and they just, they had no idea that this was the case. They, they knew that they had a problem and they know the national statistics about, you know, as Kerry was saying, you know, 10% of the NHS budget is being spent on complications to do with diabetes. You know, they had no real feeling for who they could target to better use um, the small amount of money that they had to do so going forward for the maximum impact. And that's something that we're really pleased about. And ultimately, when this product comes out of R&D and it's in an operational setting, those are the sort of things that we really want to be able to do uh, to, ne to enable this change of service to have in this case, less diabetics and less burden on uh, the NHS with diabetes-related uh, complications. So, I think this is really interesting, actually, talking about how things have changed over time, the fact we've got lots of vast data, and who to target, which part of the population is the, the, the part that we need to target. Um, Sorry, you can't see what the axis says, but I'll tell you now. On the x-axis, we've got the diabetic population. And on the y-axis, we've got the overweight population. And this is running through time. So as time progresses for these three areas in a health board, uh, these are GP, uh, represent GP uh, networks within that health board. You can see that over time, as the obese the, the overweight population proportion rises, so does the diabetic population. But from this, you can also see that the, the little orange ball shooting off there means that there's a, there's a certain GP practice as well that is suffering the most from this problem. So when you come to apply your intervention, that is a perfect target population to, to trial it on. Uh, and it's this sort of real visual stimulation that can um, get people to make decisions about where to put their funding a, a, in a meaningful way. So that was the first thing that we looked at, and it was a, a hot topic at the time, and it continues to be a hot topic. And as Kerry was mentioning, with unscheduled care, it comes in and out of focus based on what time of year you're in. So if you're in winter, the winter pressures, uh, you'll find all over the news uh, there's, there's, lots of, there's always a crisis going on in terms of unscheduled care. But when it comes to summertime, everybody forgets about it and nobody really cares, but it is still equally important. So again, just going through the same sort of process that we always do, we wanted to see what does the unscheduled care burden actually look like? Is there actually a crisis? You know, is it just something that 
uh, some the media has picked up on in one unique circumstance and has run with, or is it some sort of epidemic going on all around that everybody needs to be aware of? Uh, and we can look at the data and we can, we can tell you that for your local area. So it's very um, bespoke to your data, the analysis that we do. Um, but not only how much of it is there, who it makes up the risky population? Who are the people turning up at A&E or when they turn up at A&E are admitted as an emergency admission? What time of year is it the worst? What sort of ailments do they have before they get to that point? And can we do anything prior to that point to prevent them from turning up at A&E in the first place? Or if they do turn up at A&E, you can send them on their way quite simply afterwards without having to admit them into hospital. And if we, if we know that and we can target the population for intervention again, it's a matter of just very clever planning and that's how you can implement it back into the NHS service. So, as Kerry said, we can't show you exact results out of this project at the moment, it's still in R&D, but we wanted to show you the sort of dashboards that we deliver. You saw the automotive one and, you know, for the health we aspire to that level of detail and uh, accessibility, uh, but this is some of, some of the screenshots from the dashboards that we've been working on in R&D, and it just offers a view of the data, of your data, that maybe you haven't had before, and different views of it for different people. So there's lots of different charts going on. I particularly like the one on the, the bottom left for you, where that's showing the proportion of unscheduled admissions by deprivation quintile. And it's a beautiful trend, but it's horrible in a way because that's telling me that people in the most deprived areas are spending more time in unscheduled care than people in the least deprived areas. So again, when targeting an intervention, maybe that's where you start. You go to the, least depri the most deprived areas to see how you can help. As well as that, we can bring in other data sets and say, of all this unscheduled care, what proportion, how is it made up? You know, is it people with diabetes having most unscheduled care? Is it people with cancer? Um, and we can break it down and say, what makes up this unscheduled care? How does it relate to temperature? So the, the, the chart on the top left is showing respiratory admissions. Uh, sorry, it's showing respiratory admissions based on temperature. So you find that you get a peak of respiratory admissions when the temperature drops. So you know that in the winter, you're more likely to have a greater proportion of the population coming in with respiratory-related admissions. So the staff that you put on to deal with that should be respiratory experts in some way. And this is the sort of things that we can do and is, are accessible very instantly through this type of interface. And um, you, know, you can really show how it's broken down. This was one of my favorites that came out. And when we showed it to the, the people that we were working with, they were a bit blasé. They were like, oh yeah, I know, I know, of course, this is what's going on. But what this is showing is um, the amount of attendances at A&E um, and on the, the uh, y-axis, it's hours of the day, and then on the top, it's um, the, the months of the year. So the size of the block is telling you the magnitude of A&E attendances, and the colour is telling you how that compares on average to that particular time of day and, uh, and time of year. And you can see, this is a Monday morning that... Well, I made the assumption that nobody wanted to go to work, so they just turned up at A&E with the, the small cut on their finger, maybe, that they, they'd been concerned about over the weekend. But you can see that come 9 o'clock on a Monday morning, the demand on the service is massive. And when we showed this to our uh, partners, they were like, yeah, we know that already. Of course we know that. We see that happening. And um, we said, well, do you know why it's happening? And they were like, huh. I don't know, we speculate most of the time. But that 
evolves then into the next question and that's why as a service this this really works because we can present this stuff um, for them and then they'll say oh and now I want to ask this question and now I want to ask that question and we go forward from there and that's the, the partnership aspect this is Saturday night you can make your own assumptions as to what's going on at the early hours of the morning again uh, we, we like to present our data in a way that's accessible to a wide audience but we also want it to look cool and this is one of my favorite infographics that we use and this is showing how um, the primary diagnosis associated with an A&E attendance is broken down um, for the for whichever time period you're looking at this is 2013 and uh, a, a large proportion a massive chunk of this particular A&E was made up of joint injuries and sprains Makes sense, right? But maybe instead of putting um, an expensive, I don't know, surgeon on or physiotherapist or psycho psychotherapist on a particular time in a day, you might put more staff who can deal with a sprain on that type of day. And it, again, it's just really to help people plan much better. So this is the last thing I wanted to show you. And... It's something that if you're uh, a GP, maybe, you, you will definitely understand. And this is um, a, risk a risk model. So as Kerry was mentioning before, you'll probably find that if, in your data on the GP system, you've probably got a risk score. And to do with, in particular, emergency admission. So you've got a risk score that's saying this person is at risk of having an emergency admission in the next year. So you'll be monitored in a certain way. Um, but we wanted to bring that into our system and to have it accessible by everybody who uses it so that they don't just know at a patient level and a contract between um, the GP and the patient. We don't show patient level data, by the way. It's all aggregated to population level. But what we can show is, again, the demographic that's involved in that risk population. So if you've got the most risky population that's coming out as people who are aged 75 and over, or people who, you know, the, the, the smoking rate amongst those population is 80% compared to 25% in the standard population. You, again, you can target the right people with the right interventions so that money is not just being spent all over the place with, uh, with no real idea of where it should be targeted. It, it's targeted in exactly the right way to get the best outcomes uh, and can be monitored because everything that we do in our system is always monitored going forward in an automated way. So that's just a few of the things that we've been doing that we predict in the health sector. And again, this is still in R&D and we really hope uh, that it comes out of R&D as soon as possible because already the feedback that we've been getting from the partners we've been working with is one of amazement and shock and one person said they wanted to crawl into the screen because they'd never seen their data delivered in a way like this before um, which is a compliment and it, it's something that I think is really necessary going forward so I don't know whether Kerry wants to say anything else but if not we can take some questions much. Um, yeah, um, I wonder if you could describe some of the tools and methods that you were using in your uh, analysis and, and maybe you could make a comment on whether the data was heavily uh, structured or unstructured data sets that you were working with. So uh, for this particular analysis, like I said, we're working with the Cell Data Bank, which is a phenomenal resource. Um, so a lot of structuring is done at that end on our part for us. Um, but we then take that data and we put it into our own structure because we want this to be a business and it needs to be repeatable in terms of uh, the sort of analysis that we do. So when we do that, we get to know the data quite heavily and there is a lot of stuff in there that is unstructured. Um, but a lot of it is structured, it's varied essentially. We probably wouldn't do much with text, so free text, um, although it's not something that we do, but if there was a, 
a need to do that, we would get somebody to, to help us to do it in partnership. Um, but it's generally quite structured. Some of the methods we use, uh, we use a variety of different methods. I mean, I can comment from the data science perspective, um, lots of uh, logistic regression, or uh, we did some stuff, uh, Cox regression, we did, um, we've got quite a few, we use whatever tools are necessary to answer the question um, that's being asked, essentially. Um, the diabetes stuff with the, the simulations, we used Cox modeling to understand um, what, the pop what the population looks like. And then we took it away and created our own sort of weight loss kind of profiles in order to um, see what was going on in different scenarios. So it's varied, essentially. Well, thank you very much, Kerry.